Mon nom est Danny Damien et je suis le VFX supervisor sur Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse et vous regardez CJM. So, first question, you started as a shader writer, right? Yes. And your first movie was Hollow Man Correct. in 2000 from Paul Verhoeven, which was his, his last Hollywood movie. So, are you responsible for the gross, the beautiful look of the organs during the transformations? Yeah, I was on a, a fairly small team and we had to write um, the volume renders and the shaders that would do the transformation sequences where the gorilla first and then the main character would dissolve away and then dissolve back on. And it was interesting because uh, we had to write everything. There were very little user interfaces and there were no uh, off-the-shelf tools for us to use. And uh, how long did it take to, uh, to write all these tools? And uh, back then it was like silicon graphics, right? Yeah, we were working on SGIs. We were using Maya. We were using some RenderMan, and a lot of the rendering tools and rendering was written in-house. In terms of how long it took, there was quite a bit of development process before the movie. I think from beginning to end, it was over two years worth of work. And did you also work on the fight scene in the pool? No, I think that was done by Phil Tippett Studios, I believe. I did not personally work on, on that part of the movie. A few years afterwards, you also worked on the first Spider-Man. I did. On color and lighting. So, can you explain what you did? Is, is yeah. it the post-production side of things? Yes. Um, so for the first Spider-Man with Sam Raimi, I was on from the very beginning and I, I had a variety of tasks. I was on set for quite a bit of that, um, shooting reference footage and, and stuff that we would need to do things like recreate the crowd. And also, um, as Spider-Man got beat up and his suit got torn up, I was recording the sequence of, of how his suit got ripped and uh, destroyed so that when we did the CG portions of it, we could match it. But yeah, I've always been a part of the look, look development side and shader writing. And on that show, one of my tasks was writing shaders and look development for the show. And um, I knew the movie was uh, edited after the 9-11 incident. Yes. Was, yes. It, was there something different that we didn't see in the final cut of the movie that you worked on? You know, I, I don't know that I saw the, the first cuts of it, but we definitely had to... There was footage with the Twin Towers and we, we didn't want to use that. Yeah. yeah. So we redid shots so that uh, we could take it out. Because the final act of the movie was a big fight uh, on the Twin Towers, right? Um, you know, I should know that, but I, I'm not sure. Okay. I have to take your word for that. Okay, okay. Because the, the video game was, uh, the final act of the video game was in the, on the Twin Towers, but they were not named the Twin Towers in the yeah. video game as a respect for the 9 11 That's right. Incident. That's right. That's true. Uh, moving on, the Polar Express. Yes. Still a uh, shader, so you were the lead shader. Uh, was it uh, the skin realism that you were working on? Um, well, so that's an interesting project because Polar Express, when we originally started it, we were thinking it was going to look like the book. Well, the book is illustrated to look like it's drawn with uh, pastels. And so that beautiful pastel look and the art of the book is what one of the reasons the book is so popular and looks so good. So we started that project thinking we were going to make a pastel sort of art looking film. And I think it might have been too early to try that, but also it became important that uh, audiences recognize that Tom Hanks was playing a lot of different characters. And the more you stylize something, especially in, in the way that that book looked, the less information you have. So you're not going to get as much emotion from the characters and you're probably not going to be able to tell it's Tom Hanks as, as well. So it was decided along the way that we were not going to make it look as artistic or as, or as pastel looking yeah. and that it would be a, a little more traditional in, in its approach, uh, more detail. Yeah, it was quite detailed. It was the first uh, movie uh, with performance capture. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it did have a lot of firsts. You know, anytime you're doing something for the first time, it's hard. And I think we learned a lot. You know, I, I don't know that the fidelity was there to, to capture performances. And we also learned how difficult it is to do those kind of performances on children and women. Faces and characters that are very smooth and don't have a lot of detail. When we, when we worked on Beowulf after, if you look at the older men with beards and lines and wrinkles, those are better suited because you have a lot of features to work with. It's a lot easier to do that. But the subtlety of children, we kind of ended up trying to do the hardest thing right off the bat. I remember Rob Legato working on the first uh, Harry Potter movie yes. and having trouble with the young skin because yeah. there was no features, no wrinkles, not yeah. everything. Was it something that you uh, 
encountered, encountered as well on the Polar Express. Yes, I mean, I would agree with what Rob Locato says about that, and that is the lack of features, the smoothness of the skin, and the subtlety. You know, it's so subtle that you can't rely on uh, large cues. I think it really is the subtlety of, of children's animation that, that, that makes it so hard. Yeah, not, not just the skin texture, but, but because we weren't really dealing with materials the same way. So our, so our, our goal on Polar Express wasn't to, to make anything materially real, but we're human beings. We're so good at reading each other that, yeah. that children's performance is hard. Um, moving on to uh, what is, I don't think it's the first, you're gonna tell me if it's the yeah. first. Hotel Transylvania. Yes. It was CG supervisor. Was it your first time as a CG supervisor? Well, I actually started on Surf's Up as a CG supervisor. At the time, I was writing the image library, the shader library for the render Arnold, which would become Sony's in-house render. That was first used on Monster House. So I was working on Monster House and Rob Bredo uh, was the VFX supervisor on Surf's Up and he asked me to come on as look development supervisor and CG supervisor. So Surf's Up was the first time that, that I CG supervised. Could a step up? Uh, yeah, in some ways. I mean, I had been doing look development and some sequence supervision and I'd been at Sony for a while, so it, it felt pretty natural. So. Hotel Transylvania, yes. there was three movies. Yes. Did you, uh, you worked on the first one? I only worked on the first one. I've really only ever worked on the first of, of, of any movie. I don't think I've worked on any sequels. Is it something that you avoid? Or, uh... Uh, well, I get excited about trying to find the new look for something. And so far, uh, the thing that's made me most interested has usually been to try to do something new or, or, or to help find the look, establish um, a new look or a new franchise. Yeah. Oh, so you would not uh, come back for a second Spider-Verse? Well, I wouldn't say that. So Spider-Verse is actually an interesting thing because we really did try to do new things. And one of the things that happens when you're trying that many new things on a show is you have to finish it. So at some point you, you have to go with whatever you have learned. I think there's a lot left to, to learn. One example, for, for just for example, the cinematography in our movie that uses multi-panels and the burst cards and the words on screen. I think it takes a full movie to figure out how to use that. And then you've kind of started to understand the language. And then you can go on from there. So, so that's just one thing. But there's many things from the Spider-Verse that I would be excited to, to try to um, expand on and, and to try to create a more maybe try to explore the language that we started even further. Like the animation on twos, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could go further with that. Yeah, I mean, maybe. One of the things that we weren't sure about is because we were trying a lot of new things also for the first time, that it might be a bit of an education for audiences too. I mean, it was certainly an education for us, but for audiences also, what would work, what would, what, how would you stay engaged? We actually went further with some stuff originally and then backed out of it so that the audience could sort of get, get used to it. Because we, we really never wanted any of the ideas, any of, of the techniques of Spider-Verse to get in the way of the story. Ultimately, everything I do, everything that, that we do at uh, Imageworks, you know, is to, is to uh, support the story. Fans of the movie um, have tried to analyze yeah. the animation and tools, and they said, I asked the same question to Peter Ramsey, they thought that it was animated on tools at first, and when uh, Miles becomes more powerful, yeah. it's animated on ones. So, what do you say to that? Um, that might be, I don't think that was intentional. I'd be curious to know what uh, Peter thought about that. I don't think that was intentional, but there are some moments and some actions that work better strictly on twos and some that work less. So again, we never wanted to take the audience out of the movie and out of what's important for the story. If, for example, going between ones and twos made the action smoother, or better, we would do that. We never stuck to the idea of twos as a rule. It was just a tool, and if being on twos gave us the look we wanted, we would do it. And if it holding on threes was important, we, we would do it. So it was really what what does the action and what does the story and what does the, the emotion need? Because uh, Peter said that uh, the, the fact that the animation would evolve from 12 to 24 frames per, per second was not something you you did on the movie, and that yeah. the fans invented that actually. Yeah. Well, actually, so so that's an interesting thing. I mean, there certainly were shots that were consistent enough mm -hmm. that you could say it's um, it's 12 frames instead of 24. Yeah. But most shots go in and out. 
-hmm. So they go in, in and out of ones and twos, and often different objects are on different sets of twos. Yeah. So we ended up calling it stepped animation more than animating on twos, yeah. because even though maybe 80% of it was on twos, there was offsetting, mm -hmm. and it came in and out of being on ones and twos, and then I'm pretty sure some frames were even held longer than twos. But the idea, again, was, was to serve what would work best with what type of action and what type of emotion. So, uh, the characters, they do not look anatomically correct because you wanted to search for a certain look. Yes. And you draw lines for more 2D looks. Was it something that you envision in the movie f from the start or...? Sort of, sort, sort of. of. We, okay, so we were really inspired by illustration and the things that illustrators do with the line work. Like, you could find very simple drawings that were very emotional. And a character designer could get more emotion out of simple drawings with those lines than we could with our complicated models. There was just a, a, a beautiful simplicity to it. So the line work we knew we wanted to do in some way, we just didn't know at the beginning how we would do it. And I don't think we knew how important it would be at the beginning, but we knew that we wanted to look at it. It, it, it became obvious that that was something that, that we wanted to do. The stylizing of the characters or how real the characters were was something that we learned over time. We started with more realistic characters because we didn't want this to be a cartoon. What I mean by that is, is when you think of cartoons, you might think of like Looney Tunes or, or like Chuck Jones animation where there's a lot of squash and stretch and there's, there's not a sense of peril or danger or that something, maybe not the emotion that we want from characters. For example, if something, if something bad happens to an animated character, they get hit over the head, they, we don't really feel like they're gonna get hurt. We wanted our characters to, to not be in that cartoon world. Some of the original tests were based on reference footage that we shot of Cirque du Soleil performers. And you know, these guys can do incredible things. And so we, we had them flying off buildings, climbing up walls, all kinds of crazy things. And we used that as reference, but it never went far enough. You know, we were making an animated film, so, so we could do anything. And that wasn't far enough. So we realized that, that we wanted to push the performance further. Well, the performance, if we're going to push it further, isn't going to match if we have characters that are too realistic. The proportions are a bit too real. And the thing that really confirmed it for us when, was when we first started doing our facial animation tests. It really showed us that in order for us to be as stylized as we wanted to, to be, the characters themselves would have to be pushed, their proportions, and they would have to be more caricatured, more stylized. And as for shaders, again, yeah. in research and development, yeah. you uh, tried something of a dot printing and, and half toning. We, yeah, we, we, half toning. We, we ended up calling it. Yeah, yeah. Use of a lot of dots. So, so you know the uh, half toning uh, printing process. Um, they use different colored dots, so they don't have all the colors representable, whether it's CMYK or or whatever colors are are available. Different dot colors combined to make the final color, and there's not a smooth grad. I mean, this is stuff that we were inspired by when we looked at the older comic books where the printing techniques were uh, based on this half-toning inking process. We were looking for something that could help us in our shading and our materials that would make it unique to, to the look of our film, make it unique to the origins of our film, which is comic books. And when we saw that, we thought, well, we could use that as a rendering and, and a shading technique that would look interesting and still feel completely at home for our look. Spider-Verse is one of the few uh, good examples of great stereoscopy 3D. Yeah, yeah. And as a fan of 3D, that movie is amazing to yeah. watch, actually. So, did you work on that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, so I work closely with our stereo supervisor, and one of the things that we talked about from the beginning was um, we were already breaking all these traditional rules for how we normally do animation. There was no reason for us not to do that in stereo as well. So I think the reason a lot of people like this, this movie in stereo is it took a comic book sensibility to stereo as well. So when we make, made the decisions in stereo um, about how it should look, we used multiple cameras for whether objects are, are in the middle or, or foreground or in the background. And we would often even push and pull these objects in space. So they may not be in stereo exactly where they are in, in the real world, but, they're, but we're moving these things around uh, based on what, what emotional content and what story we actually want to tell with, with these objects. So there's a lot of times where we're flattening things out to look more like the comic book page. There are times where we're giving it more depth, but 
you'd be surprised at how much liberty we, we took in actually breaking away from where these objects in 3D space should be. And final question, as you animated the movie on uh, sequences of 12, 24 FPS, mm -hmm. what do you feel about HFR, 120 FPS? And do you yeah. feel the future should be uh, stuff, uh, stuff shot at 24 yeah. and for big action, action sequence, 120, something like that? That's interesting because I think audience have gotten used to a certain look. I mean, I mean really, I'll answer it in terms of film. So film, film has been a language that we've all gr grown with yep. and there's a certain amount of education that, 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 that happens to us um, with film. We're used to looking at film a certain way there and, and so I think the first thing that happens when you see films that are 120 frames is there's less of an abstraction, there's less of a separation from a reality so it, it feels different and sometimes it feels wrong. I know I don't want to do it for animation. And I'll say it like this, there, there are a lot of other advances that I'm much more excited about, about being a part of before the high frame rate. Like, I mean, I'm very excited about HDR. I, mean, I, I really want us to be pushing the quality of the pixels rather than the number of pixels or the number of frames. So personally, I think the biggest emotional impact for me and something that, that could help tell a, a better story for me, it would be in order of HDR, so to me that's higher quality pixels, before we start talking about more pixels, so 4K, 8K, you know, and then um, higher frame rate. But, you know, I'm probably speaking a little bit more from my point of view for animation, yeah. but um, that's kind of the priority that, that personally as, as, as an artist and a filmmaker, I. I would hold. Well, that's a great answer. I try to ask the HFR question to every VFX supervisor I can yeah. get so that uh, I can make a list, uh, yeah. a big article about HFR. Yeah. So that answer I mean, is great. I'm, I mean, I have one more answer on that, and that is uh, when I've seen the high dynamic range, high frame rate stuff of the natural world, I mean, it's incredible. So when you think of natural footage, um, nature, animal footage, the stuff where this extra frame rate and high quality really puts you in that environment, uh, that stuff's incredible. But I think that's a trying to achieve realism, and um, I'm not trying to achieve realism. <laughs>